In the last video in this series, we met Ignatius of Antioch, who made sure that he made the most of his last ever journey. On his way, we know that he got in contact with another of the Apostolic Fathers who we're talking about today, Polycarp. Ignatius encouraged him to write a few letters, just as he had done, following in the footsteps of the first apostles, such as Paul. The question is, of course, did Polycarp take his friend's advice? Well, grab yourself a beverage, get rid of your strange idea not to click the like button, and let's find out. Polycarp is, of course, classed as one of the Apostolic Fathers, and his home turf was Smyrna, where he held the lofty title of bishop. Years later, in what is now France, another bishop, called Irenaeus, would write about him, since he was from Smyrna too. Irenaeus mentions that when he was young, he had heard him preach, and in these sermons Polycarp had mentioned that he'd converted to Christianity after listening to the original apostles, including John. As we discovered last time, he was highly regarded, and he and Ignatius knew each other well, with Ignatius encouraging Polycarp to write letters like Paul did, to help stop the spread of what he called strange ideas. It would seem that Polycarp took the advice of his peer. Let's take a look at these writings that he left behind for future generations. Unlike with Ignatius, we don't have a wealth of Polycarp's writings, although what we do have from him gives a hint that he had written a few over the years. There are letters that bear his name, but the only one that scholars agree on being genuine is Polycarp's letter to the Philippians. There is a little wrinkle in the narrative of this letter, as at one point Polycarp references the death of his friend Ignatius, but later on he says he doesn't know what had happened to him. This has led some to think that the documents we actually have are two letters bundled together, but when they were copied, they were written in the wrong order. These two letters have been nicknamed the Cover Letter and the Crisis Letter. From its context, the Cover Letter was sent alongside with a collection of other letters, copies of the scribblings of Ignatius. This letter basically says that all these are a really good read and they'd be really helpful for the church that he's sending them to. Now, the Cover Letter only comprises the last chapters of the document that we're looking at, which further cements the proposal that this was just a quick hello. The second letter, called the Crisis Letter, takes up the bulk of the document, and it's where we get the spicier stuff, the bit where Polycarp does battle against strange ideas. So let's do a quick rundown of Polycarp's letter to the Philippians. For a start, this letter is packed with quotes and sound bites from scripture, and name drops Ignatius and Paul a few times most likely because both men had been influential at the church at Philippi. Many of the chapters read very similar to the letters from the Apostles, starting off with a bit of praise about how great they are, then going on to encourage the church to pursue holiness, and then chucking in a few warnings about things to avoid, such as, say, the love of money. But it becomes clear quite early on that there is a problem in the church in Philippi that Polycarp is trying to address, certainly when chapter 3 starts. Here, Polycarp says that he's written this letter of advice because the church themselves asked him for it. He then begins to press how the leaders of the church should strive to serve it, and goes on to explain how they should behave, and the sort of thing that they should be inspiring and teaching their congregation to do as well. Then, from chapter 7, we start to see what all this preamble was all about. Weird ideas and a particular person in the church. First off, the ideas. Anyone who is teaching that Jesus did not come in the flesh, is, as Polycarp delicately puts it, the Antichrist. Interestingly, he states here that humanity's sin was taken into Christ's body, and this is what folks like Paul, Ignatius, and a couple of other folks, who were probably important to this church, believed as well. He is, of course, talking about docetism, which Ignatius spoke about in his letters. Jesus, of course, was a real person who ate and drank and all that stuff, and he was not just a projection of one. Docetism will get its own video eventually, which, if I've done it, will appear in the end cards of this video for you to click on once we finish talking about Polycarp. There also seems to have been another idea floating around the church, that there was not going to be a resurrection in the end times, and also no judgement. These folks Polycarp gently refers to as the firstborn of Satan. Now, we don't know who these folks were who were asking all these questions about how the whole Jesus thing worked, but there is one name that crops up thanks to the chap that we spoke about earlier, Irenaeus. This name is Marcion, as Irenaeus records that Polycarp had also called him the firstborn of Satan. This certainly does track as well, as Marcion was a prominent docetist in the early church. 
However, in his letter, Polycarp doesn't refer to anyone by name, so we can't exactly say that that's who he's talking about. But what we can know is that these ideas were getting popular. They were getting popular enough that a prominent church figure is now having to get involved to snuff them out. There is, however, one naughty person that Polycarp talks about, a chap by the name of Valens. Valens had been booted out of his role as a church leader for being too covetous. That is, he was always after stuff that wasn't his. Money, fancy house, good horse, cool robes, you get the idea. From his lament about him, Polycarp paints us a picture that both Valens and his wife were obsessed with keeping up with the Joneses of Philippi, which clearly upset the church so much they had him removed from office. However, he's more gentle with Valens than the other troublemakers in the church, requesting that the church take them back in and guide them back onto the right path, not counting them as enemies, just as two people who messed up and needed to be restored so that they can do what they used to do, which was strengthening the church as a whole. And that is pretty much it for Polycarp's letter. But what about the man himself? What became of him? What details we have about Polycarp himself we get from Irenaeus and a document known as the Martyrdom of Polycarp. He was certainly highly regarded in the church and was instrumental in resolving some problems. One such problem was when to celebrate Easter. Now, some folks said that they should celebrate it at Passover and some said it should be celebrated on the earliest Sunday to it. This is the earliest hint we have as well for an east-west divide amongst the church, although, as we've seen so far, the church was not really unified on a lot of things. It's recorded that Polycarp went to sort out the dispute over the Easter date with Anicetus, the Bishop of Rome, and both men, who agreed on some big theological points and were both from Syria, decided pretty quickly that it wasn't a major deal as long as Easter was getting celebrated. Alas, like his old friend from the Apostles before him, he eventually fell foul of the Romans, who decided to have him executed when he refused to burn incense to the Emperor, regarding him as a god. They chose an ironic death for him as they decided to burn him at the stake. And interestingly, Polycarp's martyrdom is the earliest non-biblical martyrdom story we have recorded so far. The story goes that Polycarp was burned at the stake, but much like in the book of Daniel, the fire would not consume him, allowing him to wax lyrical about how this fire was only temporary, but the fire that awaited his persecutors was going to be eternal. Having enough of this, the Romans stabbed him with a spear and Polycarp breathed his last. His legacy, of course, is to be that bridge between the apostles of scripture and the church that would take over from them. His letter shows us that even at the beginning, the church was like it is today, having very different ideas about who Jesus was, how he fits into the theology, what his teaching and death mean, and how to live with all this information. However, there's more context to be had, and next up we'll be looking at a very important bit of literature from this period, the Shepherd of Hermas. Expect things to get a bit odd, so, until then, go grab yourself a drink, stay away from strange ideas, stop wishing you had your neighbour's car, but keep asking questions. <laughs>